The best way to play D&D is outside of D&D. This is a phrase I've said many times over the years and will continue to due to D&D's traditions limiting alternative styles of play. One would think, then, that I'd be all over Pathfinder when it was first released. While I did sign on to the thing eventually, it wasn't until a few years had passed that I got on the wagon because, to me, it still played things a little too straight. This applies as well to certain campaign settings that aren't in the high fantasy melting pot that D&D and Pathfinder exist in. Just reskinning existing races and classes amounts to the same experience, or worse in cases where the systems between properties don't exactly mesh. For example, if a fighter is expected to have a shield, how would you still make them viable without one if the setting frowns on shield use? This brings us to Final Fantasy D20, an adaptation of the series into Pathfinder's rule set, with a lot of changes to that formula. Before I begin, I should note that I'll be using the PDF for visual representation, but the site version is massively superior, and I'll link that in description. With that said, how does it hold up? Let's find out. Character creation should be fairly familiar to those who've seen Pathfinder, and we'll be exploring that with Lun as a Dark Knight once again. I should note that we'll be bending the rules a little and starting at second level instead of first. You'll see why in a moment. The first step is ability scores of which we'll be using the 4d6 method, as we've done in other d20-based games. In this regard, we start with the following scores. Strength 17, Dexterity 14, Constitution 15, Intelligence 11, Wisdom 12, and Charisma 18. Step 2 is Race. Keeping with tradition, we'll be going with Hume. This grants several benefits. The first is a plus 2 to an ability score, in this case Charisma, plus 4 on diplomacy checks to gather info, gaining Knowledge History and Knowledge Local as Class Skills, a plus one to Bluff, Disguise, and Knowledge Local, and an additional skill point at each level. Step three is Character Class. In our case, we'll be going with Dark Knight with the Dark Swordsman archetype, trading swords techniques for magic in this case. First, we gain ten skill points, which will place one each in Knowledge Religion, Bluff, Intimidate, Sense Motive, and Sleight of Hand. In addition, we gain a base attack bonus of 2, a fort save bonus of plus 3, a will save bonus of plus 3, with no reflex bonus, at least not yet. Next is the class features, some of which are from the Dark Knight class and some of which are from the archetype we'll be using. The first is the Dark Force and Living Dead limit breaks. The first allows himself and his allies to take half damage for a time, while Living Dead allows him to negate damage that would drop him below 0 HP, with the exception of critical hits. The second feature is Harm Touch, which grants a 1d6 shadow damage touch attack. And because of the first into battle feature we gain at second level, we can use one charge of Harm Touch to act in the surprise round. Third, two sword skills from the Sword Saint's sword playability, albeit with limited forms available. In this case, we'll be picking Shadow Blade and Darkness. As a companion to that, we also gain Dark Pool, which starts with 6 points and can be used to apply a plus 1 enhancement bonus to our weapon and either regain expended sword skills or use one for free. Dark Blessing is another feature that we gain at 2nd level, which adds charisma to our saving throws. And as a 2nd level Dark Swordsman, we also gain a Sword Talent, in which case we'll go with Prescient Attack. Step 4 is Feats. We gain two Feat slots, one at first level and one from being a Hume. We'll pick Weapon Focus, Greatsword, and Operator Style. Step 5 is Equipment. We start with 1000 Gil for being at second level. Now we'll go with picking a Knight Sword and a Half Plate, with 347 Gil as spending money. Character creation is about what you'd expect from a Pathfinder-based game. Although if you're looking for a simple class like the fighter is in core, this is not the work for you. Customization is the name of the game here, with every class gaining a host of abilities and having their own pool of sub-features and archetypes. With our own example, we have two feature pools to deal with, plus a set of maneuvers that will be expanded upon. That said, some old habits are maintained. Prerequisites for feats and prestige classes are still going to have the pre-planning involved. Now there's plenty to unpack, far than I can do in a single video, but it's still Pathfinder at the end of the day. 
Pathfinder uses the D20 system. I won't be explaining how that works because at its core, there's enough tutorials covering that already. So instead, I'll be covering specifically what Final Fantasy D20 does to that core. The first is Limit Breaks. Instead of doing a build-your-own Limit Break system like D6 or Omega does, each class and prestige class has one or two Limit Breaks that they gain at first level. This is treated as a standard action typically and cannot be activated unless your health is at less than half of its maximum. You start with one usage of your limit break per day and gain another use every four levels afterward, or two levels in the case of prestige classes. An alternative approach to limit breaks is the Revengeance system. This replaces the 50% roll with a titular Revengeance gauge that is capped at your max HP plus constitution score. This starts at zero and increases as you take damage. At 50%, you can use a limit break that requires a swift or move action. And at 100%, you can use a limit break that requires a standard action. Second is MP. Instead of using spell slots, Final Fantasy D20 has a character using a set amount of MP based on their level and the ability modifier of their casting class. For example, black mages use intelligence, white mages use wisdom, red mages use charisma, and so on. This grants an MP point bonus based on the ability score and the highest casting level for the character. Now, casting a spell costs as much MP as its level and is recovered after a full rest. It should be noted that there is not an arcane slash divine spell list that is universally shared among everybody. Every casting class has its own set of spells to access. And while this pool may seem small, there is options for higher or lower MP pools as an optional rule. Furthermore, spells can be exhausting if the GM chooses, with a soft cap of spells that can be cast at each level before gaining a cumulative exhaustion rating equal to that cast spell's level, requiring a concentration check or the spell fails and the MP is wasted. In a bit of a nod to Final Fantasy XI, Final Fantasy D20 possesses a sub-job system. Effectively, you gain a secondary class that is always half the level of your character level, and you only get the class skills and features from this secondary class. In this regard, MP counts as a class feature, as long as the primary class doesn't have it, and classes that get it later don't count. Another variant of secondary classes presented allows you to gain class features from this secondary class instead of feats at 3rd, 7th, 11th, 15th, and 19th level. I bring up these changes to show the degree of customization within Final Fantasy D20, but there's far more where that came from that I didn't even touch on because I can't in the interest of time. The only rule mod that I'm really iffy about is the Warriors of Light variant to allow for class switching as it's presented in games like Final Fantasy III, Tactics, Ten Two, and so on. It's an admirable attempt, but at the end of the day the D20 system isn't really meant for it. Let me make something abundantly clear. This is not for a casual run. It's clear that this is designed more for people with a D20 background than those with a video game background. Not to say you can't have both, but you know what you're getting into with a Pathfinder based game. While it does fall into some of the traps I criticize the D20 system for, there's too much it gets right in the process. There are no standard classes in this, and no class is just a one trick affair. In that regard, it reminds me of Fantasy Crafts, where options and the tweaking thereof is the order of the day. It certainly fits what I like, since I'll always go for more customization instead of less. With that said, Final Fantasy D20 gets a stamp of strongly recommended. Your mileage may vary depending on how you feel about some of Pathfinder's quirks, but it makes up for these with the rest of its output. The site continually gets updated, and I look forward to seeing this beast of a material and what it offers in the future. Now, for our finale, we'll be looking at the fourth successor to the Returners Project, and one where dual classing is inbuilt instead of an option.